Welcome to the Happy Mindset Show, episode number four. Today's episode is entitled The Learner's Toolkit. And with me, I have Michael Royley of Educated Machine. I first came across Educated Machine when I was listening to their podcast um, that was recommended by a friend. And what caught me was um, the understanding Michael and Dara have for education and their just passion for, sk- for learning and for being open to new things. So I, I said I'd reach out to Michael and see whether he get on the Happy Mindset for an interview with me. So gladly he's, he's accepted. So yeah, I'm gl- glad to be here. Uh, so yeah, you, you emailed me there a few weeks ago and just saying you were uh, you liked what we were doing with the podcast and you liked how, how our style was going, kind of resonated with you in terms of just learning and self-learning and self-development. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's great. It's good to talk to you. Yeah, thank you. So I guess my first question actually is what is Educated Machine and what's the, the vision for you? Uh, we're a mixture of an education company and development company. So we do development for clients, web and app development and designs, app design, web design as well. Uh, we've occasionally done social media for events where we've interviewed people and we've interacted with uh, different groups. We did some food festivals, which was a lot of fun, got a lot of free food. Um, and then on the education side, we do a lot of seminars and talks and different courses in data analytics uh, for Excel, data analytics for Python, machine learning, uh, Python introductory to code, JavaScript introductory to code, app development, app development with React, WordPress, uh, HTML and CSS, and a whole bunch of other stuff like social media and WordPress. And yeah, I'm just going to repeat myself now. But uh, and then the vision, I suppose the vision is ultimately is we wanted to build a company, an education company that's provides the education of like a spacefaring civilization. So it's this idea that to get to this future where I want it was, you know, humanity's out there exploring space and exploring all these new frontiers, that it's not a one person thing. You need a whole society to be elevated somewhat. So it's uh, to do that little bit to bring education up to a new standard and uh, through our seminars and talks to hopefully persuade people to actually rethink their ideas of what they can and can't learn um, especially sticky concepts like language learning and math mathematics learning a lot of people are quite um, at first pass are quite sticky in their idea of what what they can and can't do and it's just kind of break down that mm. breaking down those barriers Actually, you're, you're, you're learning French now at the moment, are you? You are, when I was into the podcast and on Duolingo, you're on about. <laughs> yeah, I am, yeah. So uh, beginning of January, I started learning uh, French using, I was using Duolingo. Uh, I was using like Michel Thomas, like the audio tapes. Uh, I was using italki, um, a few different blogs, uh, some grammar books. I was just actually, just seen a link there to a new tool that I was like, oh, I might check this one out. Um, but yeah, no, uh, a chatterbox i believe but it's for german only uh, but i just like the way they were doing it he had a nice blog about um language learning and he mentioned a few of the key language learning kind of polyglottic bloggers like benny lewis and i think it's another one called gwen something or other he's like f- f- i i know the name of the blog it's bookmarked but um so i've been using a variety a variety of different sources and i talk it says the primary one though because it's like i just talking and actually Speaking French is what I've been using a lot. I used to use that too when I was learning languages too. And you can actually make money from it too if you want to. If you want to teach your native language, you can go on there yeah, and yeah. find people around the world and earn some money as well, kind of from that. That's amazing. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I guess actually, so you went learning French now. Do you have any background in languages? How did you get the idea to start learning French all of a sudden? Uh, it's probably a similar story to you and probably a similar story to a lot of the people listening to this is. Uh, that in school I was not very good at languages and I wasn't particularly very good at mathematics um, and not being good at a subject doesn't mean I wasn't intelligent or didn't have the kind of the computational ability to learn it I just disliked school really ultimately and that dislike kind of rubbed on the subject and you kind of sometimes kind of put them together and I go oh, I don't like languages or I don't like maths and ever since I left school nearly 10 years ago, uh, this is, would be second level or high school level for any American listeners. Um, I've been constantly reevaluating different things that I thought I couldn't do. And the first one I was like, I, re- I started teaching myself again maths uh, when I was like 19, 20. And then language is just one of those other things where it's just that other barrier just started to knock it down. Um, 
and like I'd have to say now the past few months I've become slightly addicted and I'm looking forward to like oh what's my next language I'm going to learn this is really fun I really like this yeah exactly it's definitely it's uh it opens up possibilities like there's a lot of things to languages that we don't see under the hood mm. it makes when you when you learn one language it opens that kind of possibility to learn other things that aren't even related to languages that I, I found yeah because um, you you speak uh, you speak a few languages yourself do you I learned French in university, so I, I went to France for a while too, so I perfected my French and I learned Spanish and Italian. Yeah. But it was more from the desire of, of I really wanted to do it for myself, and it was kind of challenging yeah. what I thought was possible, that kind of thing. So my perseverance was there because of that. It's it's definitely quite magical, the the effect, once you have that intrinsic motivation to do something, that you're always quite taken aback at your ability to learn things. Um, and I've had it said to me before, like how how do I absorb all this information or how do I like how do I learn new subjects because I'm doing multiple things and it's just like it's purely because once you want it it becomes I don't know there's just this mental barrier that drops and I've seen it here with employees we've hired and interns that the track we put them on to get them trained up is to get them into that mindset and it's kind of like they get this magical moment where they're I think they kind of go like oh my god I finally know how to use my brain it's like it's been unlocked um yeah, it's really cool. I just and I think that's the main the grounding of that is just like that intrinsic motivation. You're doing it because you're learning. There's a great book. Um, I can't say his name. Michael uh, Chipsel or something or other. He wrote the book Flow. You've probably heard of it. Okay, I haven't read that uh, one. No, what, what is it? Is it good? It's about getting into the psychological state of flow where your the thing you're doing is it's at the right level of difficulty and ease that you know time you don't notice time going and you're just it's just in a state of just like i don't know like running water it's just like it just everything just flows nicely but he has a word called autoletic i think it is and it means the pleasure in thinking about thinking for the sake of thinking is that like so, meta thinking or is that different uh, meta thinking would be thinking about thinking yeah so it's a layer above that is it <laughs> but auto autoletic would be to get derive pleasure from just thinking about things uh, okay is that uh, kind of like it, reflecting uh it would be so like um for example, I've I really love learning about things about history. I've no intention of using my history knowledge to make money or uh, provide or do anything really functional, hypothetically, with it. But I get I derive interest and great pleasure out of it because just the sheer thought process was thinking about things, historical things, and reading stories and things like that. It's it gives you kind of an autolytic uh, feeling. So it's a uh, I think that's the one common thing I notice among self-learners is that they get great pleasure out of the process and not necessarily the goal. Um, and that's the difference. I see people who struggle to learn a language and they're very too goal oriented. They're like, I need to learn a language for a functional reason. Whereas for me, I'm like, oh, no, I just want to do like 20 minutes of French today because it makes me feel happy. That That's like it. Exactly. There's a feeling of progress. You're progressing. You're learning a few words every day and it's like a little bit of progress. It's, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, oh, cool. This is kind of fun. And my brain kind of enjoys it. And it's uh, it's like brain. I don't know. It's like uh, mental kinesthetics or is that the right word? You know, the when you do, um, in, if you're exercising, you do like you mix up the type of exercise you're doing and it's better for your targeting different muscle groups and things like that. I feel like when you're self-teaching, that mixing it up in slightly ways, like, okay, I'll do a bit of maths, okay, I'll do a bit of music, and now I'll read some historical thing. And then, you know, social interaction as well, that it's, uh, I think it's a, it's a healthy, healthy for your brain. So you're more rounded, I think, that way. That's kind of why I went towards computer programming now as well, because I wanted to uh, just think better logically and rationally. I found computer programming is really good for that, and you can get really creative too so it's a balance and it's like science half science half artist to uh yeah to do that uh like you said mentioned there you big interest in history and i heard you mentioned the end of history illusion in your podcast and I, it was something that really kind of i'd heard it mentioned before but i never heard of the actual label on it before so if you could just explain yeah. that and why it could be hiding a limitless future for people as well uh yeah so there's like deep roots to this idea so the end of history uh idea is the ultimately in terms of political science it's like the political structures we have are uh, fixed and the ones we have now they used to change you know we went from feudalism to capitalism and you know liberal democracy and things like that or uh, we go back like oh the roman republic fell and then other things rise and you know in the past things change but nothing changes now it's all done we're finished end of history job done close the book go home lads uh, 
that's the, the, the this is the idea and there was a book actually oh what's his name francis fukuyami who brought a book at the being in the 90s called end of history the last man which is the idea that liberal democracy and capitalism is one and there's more there's more to it but it's a, it's a, it's actually quite an interesting book i recommend reading it but uh but it's this idea that the the way things are now are the way things will continue to be is essentially it and you can uh, apply it to your own personal development and you look at psychologically um it's got the same name in psychology as well which is you go to an individual who's like 31 or 32 and they're a carpenter and they'll be like well that's me done i'm carpenter until my dying days i can't really transition it's you know it's an end of history for me i'm done as uh, developmentally as a person I can't envision a future where I'm 42 and I'm doing something substantially different or thinking substantially different. And it's just, there's no basis for that. It's basically a lot of, a lot of crap. You can, you, it, it, one scary thing about it is you can't necessarily predict your own future interests, but one kind of liberating thing about it is you're not bounded by anything. You're not really bounded by, uh, you're not bounded by these rules you kind of make up about yourself where you're like, ah, well, you know, I'm a carpenter now and I have to always be a carpenter or my dad was a doctor. So, and his dad before him was a doctor. So thus I always have to be, you know, I will be a doctor. And you're like, no, you can just turn around and you can just be like, I don't know, a go-kart salesman. Like you don't, nothing's, nothing's fixed. The power is that you just mentioned it there. You're making up the rules for yourself. So it's somewhat. Yeah. And by that logic, you can create different rules for yourself. You could. And to get, if you, if someone wants to deep dive into this whole subject, um, there's some stuff in a lot of stuff in political science, but there's a lot of stuff in existential philosophy. So it actually comes from a lot of uh, philosoph- philosophical thinkers like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche and Sartre and I probably mispronounced that and Camus and then up through like Simone de Beauvoir and there's more there's more future oriented ones which they have some of that philosophical idea that uh, Kierkegaard has a great quote which is you're you're condemned I think it's you're condemned to be free. Uh, what, Which is, yeah, can you elaborate on that then? What's uh Okay, I'll badly elaborate on it, but yeah, my interpretation is but it's uh the the idea that the you're not bounded by any rules. So w- one thing is uh, it can be quite scary because there is it's the ru- the universe is not telling you you have a destiny or you don't have a predetermined path in, in this, you know, in this philosophical thought process. But the kind of empowering thing is well, you don't, you know, again, it's just the reverse of the exact same idea. You don't have a destiny or a chosen path, but that doesn't mean you don't have a negative chosen path either or a positive one. You can choose this path you want to go on and you have far more freedom than you realize. And I don't mean freedom in the political sense. I mean freedom of choices uh, in every single day you do uh, from like you're in a dead end job and you have that freedom to quit that job. Now, the consequences of quitting that, you might like the consequences and they could be legitimate reasons to stay in that position. But it's the idea that you're not necessarily held in by anything. Um, they have a thing where it's like, if, if you've ever stood at the edge of a cliff, actually, and sometimes uh, you get this creeping thought that you're like, oh, I could just throw myself off the cliff. And at that point, at that point, uh, I think Kierkegaard writes about it. He's like, that's the point you realize. You're like, oh, crap, I'm, I'm actually completely free. Um, and if I did that action, if I was to do that terrible action, there's no one else. It was me that did that action. It was me that uh, did that. I'm condemned to be free to choose what I, you know, what I want to do. So um, that's a slight digression, slight digression into existentialism. But you take that idea and you can start applying it that with a bit more understanding, a bit deeper philosophical thought about it. You can start applying it to your own kind of personal development um, and what you learn and uh, what you want to become. Um, you know, it's it's a kind of quite a powerful idea. The end of history and that that you know you've got freedom to choose what you want, the life you want to live. Yeah, and it's always an illusion. I'm I'm pretty sure that people in the past would have bought into that too. That they thought there was nothing more to be ventured and so because we're not taking into account the future variables that we don't know of yet. Um, certainly, certainly. Well, like if you asked your seven-year-old, like to take the stream example, if you asked your seven-year-old self what, uh, you know, uh, present age uh, Dennis wanted to do, I'm sure it'd be vastly different. And there's no reason why present day Dennis wouldn't just be as ridiculous for, you know, Dennis in the future. future yeah. <laughs> well, that's what makes life exciting because you don't know exactly what's going to happen. It'd be boring otherwise. That's the way I, can yeah. I look at it. Yeah. Um, could you give us some examples yourself? Like you've tra- you've got your own company now. What was it like for you in the past making these pivotal decisions? 
towards what you wanted us to do. Yeah, I I suppose I had uh, a slightly different experience to most in that I think I always wanted to run a company from like a really young age, like I was 14, 15. I have a distinct memory of mom coming home and uh, she had just done a module on entrepreneurship. She'd gone back to college and she was like, oh, this module, they described the characteristics of an entrepreneur. They just basically described you. And I'm like, oh yeah, probably. Um, and But it's strange, which is one thing which is very strange is entrepreneurship doesn't mean you have to be extroverted or you have to be quite social because I'm quite a introverted kid um, and I did not enjoy secondary school both personally and just educationally. I just like, just did a lot of, I wouldn't say bullying, but just like exclusionary and just, you know, it made you feel terrible. It's just, I look back and I go, oh God, I wish I could erase a lot of that. Um, But I always had this inkling that I, and I maybe a bit of arrogance to be like, I think I can do this better myself. Um, and that kind of stuck around. And I did go to college to do mechanical engineering because uh, ultimately rockets and spaceships are what I want to build. Uh, but after that, I was like, I think I need to make a decision that I need to do something myself. I don't think I can. I've done the whole college thing. I have did what I was told. And... I enjoyed it. It was good. The education, a eh, bit suspect. Uh, like in terms of stuff, I probably could have squeezed it into a lesser time than four years. Yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, but um, after that, I was like, no, I'm going to dedicate myself now to just actually teaching myself and building something, building something myself as in like building a company. And I, I think a big thing as well with teaching yourself is it doesn't need to be a selfish or uh, activity you do as a loner so to speak you're like i'm just going to teach myself i've never talked to anyone um because i did discount for a while i discounted the value of certain kind of social the social education as well around like you're stuck on a concept and it's the strangest thing you could be stuck on a concept for weeks and then you have one conversation with someone and they just clarify it completely and there's something about i think that uh the humans are equipped to absorb a certain type of knowledge through social interaction more effectively than any other form. Like and, os- osmosis. Uh, kind of, kind of, I, I, don't, I don't know what it is, yeah. It maybe it's like some sort of osmosis where you're picking up on secondary signals or... Actions and behaviours and stuff. Yeah, and, and like you can adjust the conversation. Um, so, yeah, I started down that path of building a company and teaching myself and now I'm kind of just like... Like I regularly, I have a little Trello board where I plan out what I'm going to learn and what I want to go on to next. The next pro, like next pro- personal project I'm working on is to build uh, some underwater robotics, an autonomous underwater robot. And I'm just going through the process now of like learning the different aspects of that and the different pieces. Um, and I, like, I feel like I'll continue that in some form. I may not continue the same things I'm learning, but I think I can't get that. Uh, I can't get rid of that appetite now to just continually learn and improve and develop so listen to here how, how do you find the time for all this like do you have any systems in place like how do you is it something like in my experience in it kind of builds up over time that it's not like me trying to do everything michael's doing all at once i kind of go no that's a good idea grab it, and then it'll just build on each other kind of and i actually i find with learning too is that you have to think less as you learn more it's kind of like um it's like compounding like compounding in finance compounding is learning too i think it's like it compounds over time so it's easier to learn something no, that makes that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. I'd, I'd agree with that. There's definitely, uh, to take even a simple example like mathematics, uh, a lot of the later mathematics becomes easier when you have a more solid grounding in the basic mathematics. A lot of code becomes easier once you learn your first coding language and grapple with that and build a few projects. Um, you can fall into a plateau effect where you're not constantly improving, but like it's interesting and you probably notice it when you learn different subjects, you suddenly start to see the interrelations and lessons between things. You mentioned something earlier, uh, probably, I think it wasn't when we were recording, but it was uh, about language learning. You said uh, the different structures of language and you found it easier to pick up like the next language after learning the other two, uh, Spanish yeah, and Italian. Especially within the, the same language family, it'll be like once I master the word structure of one language, I apply it to the next and I use word usage frequency to learn the right words for me so I can yeah. start talking. So I definitely think there's a, yeah, I uh, definitely think there's a compounding effect there. Um so your time, and how do you how do you find your time? time? Oh yeah, answer, yeah. yeah. Answer <laughs> main, the question. Main question. <laughs> you answer like one question and I'll talk for like ten minutes. Um <laughs> but how do I find time? Um I'm not really a big one for very strict systems. There's things like uh, I've listened to a few podcasters and I've talked to a few people who do things with 
noting things down and they've get things done that method from david allen the book and a few alternative methods i don't really like them my mind does not it doesn't like too much structure so what i do is um i just set myself a goal of i'm going to dedicate 20 minutes each day to do x and then I'll make a list the night before of the things I have to, to get done the next day. I'll cross them off off the day and I'll make sure it's a paper list, um, which be, the reason why it's so important is, one, paper is just, it's not a distractive medium. You, you can't, you know, you just look at your list, there's nothing else to do with it. Uh, but also is I'll throw away that list at the end of the day. So I'm not beholden to f- tasks I didn't get done during the day and I'm not stressing myself over things. And if it is important, I have to manually transfer it by rewriting it. And you'll find that that act of manual transfer, you go, uh, this to-do item I had on my list for the past week, it's not actually that important. I'm just not going to do it anymore. Um, that's one, th- one method I do. And then the other is, uh, I would say I'm strategically lazy, actually. Uh, I see a lot of, I like sleep and I like just relaxation and like my own personal headspace where I'm like, okay, I'm just going to relax with something. How important is, is that, that sleep and having a good diet and, and for what you're doing? Actually, yeah, they're, they're good ones. I, I do. Um, sleep, super important. Uh, it's, you'll like it, getting that one hour extra sleep you need to get that back by being a maybe five to three or percent more productive per hour the next day. So in other words, you can easily get it back. Um, it's a false equation. I think people are not, they don't understand the percentage right where they're like, oh, I'll work this two hours late at night. But you're like, yeah, but you're robbing that two hours from tomorrow. And now your tomorrow is, your each hour tomorrow is 10% less productive. So added up, you've basically had a net kind of, a net balance in terms of productivity, you've gained two hours late at night, but then you lost 10% on each hour the next day. So you've basically lost like, you know, eight hours completely or like six hours completely. It's just a false, false balance. So sleep, super important. Quality sleep is super important as well. So um, try not to use comp- uh, devices too late. Or if I am to use devices, I use those things that dim it red, uh, like Flux or Twilight on the Android, because uh, blue light will kind of keep you awake. And then diet, uh, yeah, I like kind of, I like cooking stuff and listening to like, I'll, it's a great time, I'll listen to a podcast or an audiobook, and I'll be just cooking stuff and I'll try to make like just fresh veg and just um, different meats, like, you know, standard stuff. I don't really, don't really have like a diet plan or anything, it's just like, I just go for the basic food groups and just eat them in moderation, like it's not really that harder. And then exercise, um I'm one of these weird people that really enjoys exercise. So I look forward to being like, oh man, I can't wait to go for a run. Did or, you always enjoy exercise or was it something you got into? Uh, did I always enjoy exercise? I I think, I think I enjoyed it when I was younger and then I fell out of love with it in college somewhat because then I started to think about it too functionally. As in, oh, I'll exercise to get fit or if you're a man and like most men will deny it but it's a big thing which is oh i'll get i'll get fit because it'll make me look good and i'll be able to attract people for superficial reasons that wouldn't yeah, yeah certainly yeah. yeah certainly um but now it's like i look at going to the gym or going for a run or going for a swim as like it's like this stress reliever and i'm honestly like i'll be in the gym and i'm like i'm kind of smiling just like i'll be listening to music and sometimes i listen to a podcast but a lot of times i'll just put it spotify i'll get like discover weekly and just play that and it just uh it chills me out really and that's i think that's maybe why i start to enjoy it more and i kind of tend to do it more uh, because um just kind of relaxes me it's a simple thing to do like you can't fail at running or you can't really fail at like lifting things and then putting them back down where you found them you know you're like it's, so at least you're succeeding at something during the day then. <laughs> yeah exactly you don't have this this terrible dread that you failed as like a, a creator because like you know as you know if you create something it's quite open-ended about when the project is done but it's not open-ended about like lift this 20 kg weight and then put it back down again and you're like oh it's a very clear task there's very clear defined goals there i can do that yeah we kind of overlook the stuff we can we can already do it's like i can't do anything right and this kind of stuff but you're going to the gym right you're doing these sort of things right um yeah I think we yeah, there's a tendency to kind of overlook that you get in you can get more into limitations then i think yeah. the subtle difference is is turning things just looking at things as possibilities rather than limitations all the time and you can start off by looking at something that you want to do and just kind of entertain the idea that it could be a possibility to do something different 
or to yeah. try something different kind of yeah that's the way another thing that came into my mind there was what for you would be a productive day like hours like like for example we often look at things and be thinking people are working 12 hour days but they're not really being that productive surely you couldn't be 100 percent, 100 percent agree and i think it, there's a sort of um male it's a very male bravado thing where to like to show off like look how many hours i work and am i so much harder working and i dedicated it and it's like it's a load of bullshit you know you're not being as you said you're probably not being as productive as you think you are your quality of work is probably not as good um i'd say if i was to time it i get maybe high quality like intensive focus work i get a maximum of about six hours a day at a max that for me sounds um, about right now yeah and that's um, not a good day i'd say as well <laughs> exactly no that's on a good day um like a lot of times it's like four hours in the whole day and people hear that number and they go oh my god that's barely anything but it's like eh, it's better than doing like working your ass off working 14 hours three days in a row and then not working for the next two weeks because you're burnt out and there's a, certain, there's a lot of busyness to it too busyness it's not productivity it's busyness that that and that there's probably eight hours of busyness three hours four hours maybe i don't know but yeah it's uh I think it would be a lot it'd be a lot lighter as well if we had this idea that we're going to work for four hours a day but actually put in four hours of proper work and then we can take the rest of the day to relax. Well, that's the, I think it's Parkinson's law. Uh, work fills the allotted time. So the less time you, the less time sometimes you have for a task, the quicker you are to get it done. Yeah. Um, so one thing I, when I started the business, the one mistake I made was I, in a weird way, worked too hard and I would work really late, like to nine or 10 at night, get up at like eight in the next morning and do the same and my work just wasn't as good quality i wasn't as happy um i had a few friends uh who were just like oh you just look unhealthy you know um so now it's just like it's uh, i it's a task on my task list like every day to be out of work before 6 30 um normally i'm out of work now at like 5 30 and that's enough time to go to the gym exercise come back cook some food and then around 7 30 i'm like ready to maybe work or read on some personal projects or relax or do whatever i want really but um yeah it's it's it all ties into that limiting you know not not working crazy hours and working this 12 hours you know 12 hour run of straight work it's just a, it's it's a false promise it's, i don't think it's true that these people are actually getting these productive figures um like i question it's quite a question it like a lot of them you'd see a lot of uh, when you dig deep into a lot of things where you see kind of certain me- memes or ideas repeated where it's like, oh, Elon Musk works 14 hours a day. You're like, does he actually, like if we looked into it, does he actually work 14 hours solid day? Or is he like six of those hours where they like just like him walking around talking meetings and greeting people? And, you know, you're like, I don't know how much deep work he was actually doing in that 14 hours. Um, I think there's a tendency to look at other people who say, say these numbers like they're working 14 hours or 12 hours a day and it makes them sound superhuman. And anytime I hear that, I, I can feel like a, a certain, and maybe you get this well, a certain Irish mentality of like, ah, it's probably a load of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to say that. I know what I find helpful is just like not to worry about other people, just to look at myself and see what I could be doing better and who I could be collaborating with who's in a similar kind of situation as me. That's all mm. that really matters for me. It's kind of... And that frees up a lot of my time. Then I'm not spending time with this thought process in the back of my head, looking at other people, comparing myself to other people, that kind of stuff. It, it gives mm. frees up space to create then a bit more. Mm. That makes sense. No, that makes sense. Um, and and like, do you, what for you? Um, do you work better in the morning or work better in the evening? I've never really noticed. I can kind of like, I just kind of go more by a feeling. Am I feeling like I'm wanting? to mm. do something now or, or not it's kind of yeah. like i've got a job so i'm going to my job in the set times but then when it comes to writing like i write for my blog there and doing these podcasts and stuff it's like well i actually do the podcast around the interviewee but it's kind of like from a from yeah. my writing anyway it's like if i get an urge to write i'll write if i get an urge to uh, learn programming i'll have this kind of idea I'll, I'll learn 30 minutes of python today i don't know when exactly but it'll come up at some stage even with duolingo i've gone back doing a little bit of that again just to Mm. keep up with my italian and um i just commit to five minutes a day every day and it just kind of builds that consistency for me again in yeah. one small area so it's kind yeah. of like that it's like i approach it and i think i'm getting the impression that you approach it the same way it's like an integrated lifestyle i don't want to define here's my work dennis here's my relationships my social life i want to have it all combined into one that's my uh 
Oh, certainly. And like, don't get me wrong. I get the balance occasionally wrong. Like, I might err too much on, in a weird way, I might err too much on the learning side of things and, or I neglect, you know, I neglect some things in work. And it's, I'm always self correcting that balance. It's, it's a, it's a constant process. Um, that's good too. Yeah. It's kind of you're you're learning, improving the system, just being open to adapting. That's kind of the main thing. It's like I just I just know I'm never going to get it perfect, right? Actually, what I've heard you talk about perfection on your podcast, and I just want to yeah. So Dara Dara, who works in Educated Machine as well, um, he is much more of a perfectionist than I. And we had a blog all about perfectionism, and there's some great bits in that about like the level like ex- athletes will go to, you know for the perfect game and things like that and the psychological effects of perfectionism um i would say i am not a perfectionist and if you were to meet me you're just like i maybe uh, i'm on the other side of like being totally blasé about things i'm like oh i'm probably class this i'll just try that uh whereas daru is much more thorough and perfectionist and i've actually learned a little bit of him of the process he does um that's one big thing i learn a lot of things from other people seeing how they work uh, like his process of just laying out things and maybe planning them a bit more um and i think he's a little bit rubbed uh, seen the effect of me rub off on him which is just like my kind of like confidence in knowing that i'm like oh it doesn't you know you know it it's it's okay you don't need to worry about it don't try to get it 100 percent perfect just deliver it um but perfectionism yeah i would say having seen it in other people it's it's like a disease it's like just it stops you from really delivering delivering products delivering um delivering whatever you're interested in or helping you learn the right thing i see so many people uh, trying to learn code and they're like what's the best language to learn and you're a code language to learn and you're like the one you're interested in just start on something you know yeah it's all paralysis, uh, paralysis you can get into because you've got this perfectionist tendency that stops you from doing anything in the first place yeah there's a there's a thing with perfectionism with the maximizers versus uh, just I think it's justifiers and maximizers. Uh, or no, maximizers and satisfiers. So a uh, a satisfier, if their washing machine broke and they went out and bought one, they'd see one for two hundred euro and they'd buy it. The maximizer would uh, scour reviews and they would look for deals and then they'd get one for you know 180 euros the best one in the model range and the price range and then next week they would see a price reduction and maybe there's a washing machine for 140 euro that they would kick themselves and they'd be like oh man i missed out on that i you know i wasn't perfect with that where the satisfier wouldn't they wouldn't even notice that they'd be like ah grant but i kind of wanted the washing machine right now i don't care you know it's I'm just satisfied with what I have. So there must be a lot of decisions made like that in business too, I would say, if otherwise you'd be kind of kicking yourself for all decisions you've kind of made wrong. What's kind of the balance you've seen in that for, for business decisions? Uh, for business decisions, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of stress of worrying about the right decision. Uh, you've got incomplete information most of the time and you need to make a quick decision with incomplete information. Um, it's not something I've thought about too deeply, I heard somebody uh, mentioned that once you're at it, like, set, I don't know how you gauge it, you wouldn't be able to gauge it perfectly, but somebody yeah. said that once you got up to, like, 70% of, of the information, you should make a decision then and know if you're going over that, you're, proc- you're like, you're kind of, there's diminishing returns to that, to make Certainly. a good decision. Yeah, uh, I, I believe that. And there's a lot of stuff, like, I've been doing a lot more AI stuff lately, and reading about, like... Um, how emotions fit into AI and a lot of evolutionary stuff around emotions, you start to realize emotions are like a shortcut for that process of like, make a decision now with the 70% mark, stop trying to gather information. It's better to make a decision now with less information than to wait and get more information. And it's like, uh, if um, let's say a Google car is driving down the road and someone cuts it off, the Google car is not going to get angry or get annoyed. Yeah. Uh, it needs to calculate a load of different things and it'll calculate far too many variables. It'll be like, well, was that person like, had a reasonable reason to cut me off and you know, what are all the possibilities? And there's such an innumerable amount of variables that it, it takes so long to gather all the, the required information to make the absolute best decision. Whereas with a human, the best decision might be like, ah, oh, fuck them, they cut me off. How dare they do that? Like, you know, if I see them, I'm going to tell them off or, you know, tell them not to do that. Or uh, So emotions, I, I sometimes think that... Uh, with AI and robots that with rather than getting Skynet, we're going to end up with Bender from Futurama. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, emotions seem to provide a certain heuristic value for 
kind of analyzing situations and knowing things. And I think everyone's been in that position where you've been in a relationship that you know is about to end or you know a decision that you have to make and you can feel it in your gut and you can feel that like feeling and you push it away because you're like, no, I need more information. Whereas if actually in a weird way, if you kind of listen to your own emotions, you would have made the decision quicker and probably had a better outcome. That's it. That's actually the curious thing I find too. I don't think I've actually asked you this question. It's one of the questions I wanted to ask you. Mm. Um, just first, what the way I see things going is that automation will, like AI and these advancements, will be able, will be able to automate things a lot quicker. So computer science will be pretty important. But then mm. the one thing I think people can't, we can't ever automate is human intuition and our gut feeling. Um, unless I'm, unless somebody's working at it right now, I don't know. But that's the one intangible thing. So for uh, me, it's kind of like yeah. that balance between computer science and an understanding of the mind, mindfulness, and whatever area you want to go down. I think that's going to be really important in the future. Um, I just wanted to, to get your ideas on that and how we could incorporate it into our own our Irish education system in some way. Uh, yeah, I I do a lot of thinking about education and where it's going. Um, in terms of robotics, I think AI is definitely coming down the line and will disrupt a lot of things, but I don't think it's coming at the speed like the people like Ray Kurzweil and the Singletarians kind of uh, say it's going to come. Um, there's a lot of like I- issues, like even automated cars, I think they will inevitably come, but they're not going to come as fast as people think they are. There's a lot of edge cases and issues. and Even government uh, regulation too will hold things back as well. Government regulation is a big thing, but also just like there's a lot of biases in the people who are developing them. And I don't mean in a negative sense. I mean, in the sense that like a lot of them, like they're developing self-drive cars on sunny Californian roads. You're like, try a self-drive car on an, a small Irish country road where you need to mount the ditch a bit. You're like, that's going to be hard. Yeah. yeah it's going to be pretty hard to pr- program that or try to, pr- uh, you know, try to program a situation where people are, know the self-drive car will never get angry. So they keep cutting it off and don't let it get, get out, even though, they're being making an illegal move like there's i think human ingenuity and human kind of like deviousness is uh much deeper than people think but uh on the intuition side and developing intuitions it's a tough one i'd have to think about it more but i think at its core it's like it's teaching people kind of metacognition i guess thinking about thinking and thinking of the brain as like a malleable muscle and uh teaching a certain philosophy or certain type of wisdom um yeah because i i don't like these things i love mathematics and i love uh, engineering i did engineering and space travel and everything like that but i don't like these reductionist kind of arguments where they're like no we need to teach maths and we need to do engineering because that's all good and you know that's what builds society and you're like no there's value in like poetry and art and great literature and learning languages and um just people discussing like their emotions and people discussing different religious ideas like there's all loads of value in that so an education system well, we're not robots like that's the thing yeah we're it shouldn't necessarily yeah it shouldn't necessarily just be like teach really functional things so i don't know I'd, um it's a tough one like it's there's a few approaches a few approaches no canonical approach i think that's why education is so hard to reform because no one really agrees on everyone agrees that it needs to change but no one agrees how it should change but I suppose yeah. the best we can do is give alternatives. Like the one thing I've seen the internet do is that you you can learn anything now. And you can find online courses and stuff. So at least we have that. Certainly. Uh, I guess for the for the mindfulness part, I said a lot of the happy mindset too is about understanding the mind. And I can kind of the way I look at things is that I use my analytical mind for maths and these mm. kind of things, learning skills, and I, and then my wisdom and my intuition is just from a place of taking the time out to have a clear mind and and just kind of being kind to myself and just kind of going relaxing yeah. and stuff. And then, like, answers can kind of bubble up and stuff like that because you're not trying, you're not forcing something. That's not, that's, the mind is kind of more, um, it works best when you're calm. It's like, you're yeah. just calm. You're not trying to bend it to your will. You're just, like, letting things happen. Yeah. Uh, so it's trying to find that balance, I think, is kind of the way I look at yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. So I think my last question for you, I could speak to you, to all, <laughs> I could speak to you all day, but we have to yeah. draw it somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess your your favorite book and why you've mentioned a few, but uh, do you have a favorite book? Oh, a favorite book. Um, I have three. I have three books. Three books that I re- re- particularly like. Theme so far. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Common theme? More than one? Is it? Not in the last. The last few people I've interviewed, they said three as well. <laughs> yeah, I think three is like one of those sweet numbers. It's like, uh, yeah, it's like what's your favorite number between one and ten? People, most people will say seven. And what number is male? Most people will say one. And what number is female? Most people will say two. Yeah. 
it's interesting um anyway th- th- beside the point um i would say i was in i enjoyed it and influential hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy actually real uh, that that's that book i've read a few times really enjoyed it uh not a singular book but i feel like the harry potter series in a weird way it was quite formative because i read it at a quite an interesting time and then can i add a fourth book to this list so you've given me have you given me two so far or is it yeah, yeah. he checks guide galaxy and i gave you the whole harry potter series so i kind of cheated there a bit <laughs> um, not one all of them you'd pick no no they're all good they're all good uh prison of azkaban is clearly the best and i think that's everyone accepts that uh on john john stuart mills on liberty it's a one of the first kind of philosophical books i read all the way through um it's from a guy called john stuart mill um but it's about classical liberalism and liberty and uh, from he's a parliamentarian in like 1820 1830 and around the time of the reform act in like i think the reform act was like 1833 or something like that i can't remember um yeah that was just really influential his arguments and his styles and then i, I it kind of dove me into listening to more podcasts around it and interpreting it and you can't any philosophical text like a religious text you can't take it all just on face value there's like depth and tradition and history there and then the last book it's not a book i can remember actually the name but it's a book that usually influenced me my mother used to read me this book with uh, different countries uh, cities and uh, it had the capital cities and it had a fact about each country uh and it was just a normal kids book about geography and the geography of the world and it had like my favorite city was Reykjavik at the time because i thought it was like a funny name and i was like eight i'd say that book probably unintentionally has influenced me more than any other book because i get really excited meeting new people from other countries and i know like these little geography facts about them and a part of me is like i think i learned that geography fact when i was like eight when i was ma'am my mother used to read me this book uh so maybe it's not it's still conversation starters for you (laughs) Yeah, so maybe not the traditional kind of book list. Um, yeah, just get I, the name. Get the name of it. I'll put all these books in the the notes as well, so people can actually click in them and buy them if they're interested in these things. I would do. Yeah, just send me over the name of that book, and we'll get it in there. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Um, and one book recently uh, I really enjoyed was "Better Angels of Our Nature." I finished that it was uh, Stephen Pinker's book about the decline of violence historically. Um, just a good book. Yeah. Yeah, that is quite good because yeah, I've seen like if you actually look at the data, violence has decreased instead of like being. A, thing is you can look at things sometimes you can think the world's more dangerous than it is but historically if you're looking backwards it's not it's actually progressing in a good kind of fashion well, well i think it's powerful um i uh, like i get annoyed at a lot of people our age who are cynical about politics or change in that regard because uh, they see it's not it's not easily changeable things don't get better and in a weird way the uh, statistical fact that things are you know less worse maybe is the best word than it was in the past doesn't mean there's not loads more things to do and loads more things to fix it just means that some of the stuff that has been done in the past has worked and there's no reason why new st- new things can't work and improve the world as well so it's it's a weird way it's like an optimistic outlook but also in a weird way a realistic outlook because you're like there's still loads of work to be done it's the world is less worse but it's the world is not perfect mm-hmm well, yeah, at least the foundation is moving in the right direction. We just need to exactly, build on top yeah. of it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah, perfect. No, thanks for taking the time today, Michael, to mm. talk to us and to share that your That was good insights. to you. Cheers, Dennis. Cheers. Thanks a lot. And uh, apologies for giving you like five or six books as my one book recommendation. Yeah, I've got a few weeks not to... Or, yeah, I'll have to throw them all in the notes, but yeah, that's fine. The more yeah, options, well. the better for people. Cool. Yeah. Perfect. All right. All right. Best of luck, Dennis. Bye-bye. So, uh... Until next time, uh, uh, have fun and enjoy the process.